I think possibly two of the best known and most wonderful verses in the book of Proverbs is Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, and in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now here you have perfect direction from God, a threefold instruction. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Second, lean not to thine own understanding. Third, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and the reward stated, and he shall direct thy paths. Trusting in the Lord, friends, with a whole heart. Now, there are people that are trusting with their mind, but their whole heart. Recently, I've been talking to a man on the telephone several times. He has a real deep problem. And constantly as he talks, I've been trying to direct his mind towards trusting God in prayer and believing in God with his whole heart. But he's always like Jacob, scheming how he can help God do this thing. That's not what God says. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Now, the Lord here is the Lord Jehovah, which means the great I am, the one who is going to be to you what your need will be. So learn to trust in him. Then thirdly, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Not only must we trust him entirely, but exclusively. No confidence in the flesh, friends, can consist together with the confidence in him. It must be total confidence in him. He's not going to go halfway. You scheme one half of it, and he does, does the other aspect of it. No. We are not to neglect our understanding, but to cultivate it and diligently in all its faculties. That's right. For God never smiles upon ignorance, but the admonition is don't lean on that understanding that is upon the flesh and put your hope in the flesh, but use God's enlightening word and what God has to say to us, always depending upon God and his directing and overruling providence in all things. And then the third thing, and this is on, and on the negative side, lean not unto thine own understanding. Uh, the positive is lead on. Trust in the Lord, which we've already discussed with you. Now, self-dependence is absolute folly. Turning to the 28th chapter of the book of Proverbs, verse 25 and 26, he has these words to say, He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso trusteth or uh, walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Now, this is God speaking. So let's learn to trust God in these things. Uh, so self-dependence, I said, was folly. And in fact, self-dependence is plain rebellion, going our own way. Let me take a case of the Old Testament. You remember when uh, Samuel sent Saul out that he was to completely blot out the memory of Amalek. Now, Amalek had sinned until the God says there is no more hope for that people. I want them blotted out, every single one. But Saul went out on his own. Read about it in the 15th chapter of First Samuel, uh, where Saul thought, well, he knew a little bit better, and he listened to the people, and they wanted to keep the best of the sheep and the best of the cattle uh, for uh, offerings, they said. That was not possibly not the reason. God knows the heart. But anyway... Uh, when Samuel finally confronted him and said, but God told you to go and destroy Amalek, and you would not do it. And then Samuel says something that I want you to get. First Samuel fifteen twenty three, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and uh, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. In other words, Samuel, in the name of the Lord, fired Saul from being king. Now, that's very plain, but there it was. Now, we find that the people of Israel did exactly the same thing. And it was uh, a Nehemiah who was praying unto the Lord. And in his prayer, he said some of these type of words. He says, the people have hardened their necks, and they have not hearkened unto thy commandments. They refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them 
but they hardened their heart necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return uh, to their bondage. But thou art the God ready to pardon, and so on. So he said, in their rebellion, God says if we lean upon our own understanding, we are literally rebelling against God. This is exactly what happened uh, to Adam and Eve in the garden uh, when they rebelled against God too. They went their own way, thinking they had understanding. You see, the devil came to them in the form of a serpent in this case. Uh, For God doth know, he says, that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw, ah, she listened to him instead of to God. She listened to her own understanding. Well, this man says, this person says, that it's better for us to eat this fruit. And she says, when she saw that it was good for fruit, and was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was the desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave to her husband, and he also did eat. There you have rebellion again, all because they were leaning on their own understanding. So we are to seek for his understanding, always God's understanding. Remember that Christ is made unto us knowledge and wisdom, and he gives us proper understanding. In 1 Corinthians, the uh, first chapter, and in verse 30, I read this, but of him are ye all in Christ Jesus, whom God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. God has made Christ this to us. That's why he says, do not lean on your own understanding. Second Corinthians 3, verse 5, uh, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think as anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. We're not to be push-button robots, not the kind that God says, well, uh, you don't know anything, and I'll push the button and you'll do this and you'll do that. No, no, not that. But intelligent beings indwelt by the Lord himself, who is all and everything to us. He wants us to think, or he wants to think through us, always remembering that, as Paul said in Romans seven eighteen, that in the flesh dwelleth no good thing, To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I know not. So in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, we read, and in verses uh, 3 to 5, uh, how that we have other weapons that God has given to us. Let me read this to you. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not fleshly, in other words, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every good thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We are to be submissive unto him, for he is everything, and he will guide our thinking. In the second chapter of Proverbs, as we studied there, we read these verses, verse 3. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice uh, for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as a hid treasure, Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and thou shalt find the knowledge of God. You see, it's more than man's understanding. Lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, he says in the last half of that great verse. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. There you have the the promise. But first of all, in all thy ways acknowledge him. Since our confidence is in him, Let it be uniform, that is, in all thy ways. Take one step at a time, but always under divine direction. This expression covers the whole area of life's action. Everything that uh, that we undertake, whether it's spiritual, whether it's secular, public, or private, not just the great crises, not just the solemn acts of worship or duty, but no, we are to... uh, Take all things unto him, and in all thy ways acknowledge him, and then he shall direct thy path. Keep that in mind again, all thy things. Someone called this so-called self-idolatry, when I try to do it in my own understanding, uh, to conceive that we can carry on even the ordinary matters of the day without his counsel. He says he calls that self-idolatry. So be in the habit of going to him in the very first place, 
before self-will and self-pleasing and self-wisdom and, and human friends and, and uh, conveniences and expediences and so on uh, should overshadow and dictate to you the way. Before any of these have been consulted, go to God at once. Go to him first and always at once. Never consider circumstances first and so claim uh, that his direction is not needed. But in all thy ways, acknowledge him. In all thy ways, small uh, as well as the great one, acknowledge him, bring him into the picture. Take, for instance, Abraham. Wherever he pitched his tent, there he always built an altar unto the Lord. This we saw in Genesis 12, 7, again in Genesis 13, 18. But do you remember when he went to Egypt, this was on his own initiative? There was no altar there. There was no companionship with God there. When he wanted to choose a wife for his son Isaac, again he trusted in the Lord totally. He did not ask for riches, honor, and these type of things uh, for, from the servant to go and find the bride for his son. Only concerned about the name and the honor of the Lord. The servant was the same way. So we acknowledge him, remember. Not merely a uh, what I call a theoretical knowledge or acknowledgement of him, but in every practical aspect of life, acknowledge him as the God of power, the God of wisdom, the God of goodness, of justice, and of every part of our life and our walk. Know God's way of righteousness. Acknowledge him in all thy ways implies that we are first uh, to ascertain whether our, the undertaking is according to his plan and to his will and then he will enlighten you along the way. Thank you for listening to Back to the Bible. Join us again tomorrow. God bless you.